Well, you've, uh, on the topic of concurrency, you've written the Swift Concurrency Manifest. I think it's it's kind of interesting. Anything that uh, has the word manifesto in it is very interesting. Uh, can you summarize the key ideas of uh, each of the five parts you've written about? So what is a manifesto? Yes. How about we start there? Uh, so in the Swift community, we have this um, problem, which is on the one hand, you want to have relatively small proposals that you can kind of fit in your head, you can understand the details at a very fine grained level that move the world forward. But then you also have these big arcs, okay? And often when you're working on something that is a big arc, but you're tackling it in small pieces, you have this question of, how do I know I'm not doing a random walk? <laughs> yeah. Where are we going? Yeah. Like, how does this add up? Furthermore, when you start that first, the first small step, what terminology do you use? How do we think about it? What is better and worse in the space? What are the principles? What are we trying to achieve? And so what a manifesto in the Swift community does is it starts to say, hey, well, let's step back from the details of everything. Let's paint a broad picture to talk about how, what we're trying to achieve. Let's give an example design point. Let's try to paint the big picture so that then we can zero in on the individual steps and make sure that we're making good progress. Mm -hmm. And so the Swift concurrency manifesto is something I wrote three years ago. It's been a while, maybe maybe more, um, trying to do that for, for Swift and concurrency. It starts with some fairly uh, simple things, like making the observation that when you have multiple different computers or multiple different threads that are communicating, it's best for them to be asynchronous. Right. And so you need things to be able to run separately and then communicate with each other. And this means asynchrony. And this means that uh, you need a way to modeling asynchronous communication. Uh, many languages have features like this. Uh, async await is a pro popular one. And so that's what I think is very likely in Swift. Um, but as you start building this tower of abstractions, it's not just about how do you write this? You then reach into the, how do you get memory safety? Because you want correctness, you want debuggability and sanity for developers. And how do you get uh, that memory safety into, um, into the language? So if you take a language like Go or uh, C or any of these languages, you get what's called a race condition when two different threads or Go routines or whatever touch the same point in memory. Right. And this is a huge, like, m maddening problem to debug mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, it's not reproducible generally. And so there's tools, there's a whole ecosystem of solutions that are built up around this, but it's, it's a huge problem when you're writing concurrent code. And so with Swift, uh, this whole value semantics thing is really powerful there because it turns out that math and copies actually work even in concurrent worlds. And so um, you get a lot of safety just out of the box, but there are also some hard problems, and it talks about some of that. Um, when you start building up to the next level up and you start talking beyond memory safety, you have to talk about what is a programmer model? How does a human think about this? So a, a developer that's trying to build a program think about this, and it proposes a really old model with a new spin called actors. Actors are about saying we have islands of single-threadedness, logically. So you write something that feels like it's one programming one program running in a, a unit, and then it communicates asynchronously with other other things. And so making that expressive and natural feel good, be the first thing you reach for and it being safe by default is a big part of the design of that proposal. When you start going beyond that, now you start to say, cool, well, these things that communicate asynchronously, they don't have to share memory. Well, if they don't have to share memory and they're sending messages to each other, why do they have to be in the same process? Hmm. These things should be able to be in different processes on your machine. And why just processes? Well, why not different machines? And so now you have a very nice gradual transition towards distributed programming. And of course, when you start talking about the, the big the big future, the, the manifesto doesn't go into it, but uh, accelerators are async things you talk to asynchronously by sending messages to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how do you program those? Well, that that gets very interesting. Um, that's not that's not in the proposal. So, and uh, how much do you want to make that explicit, like the control of that whole process, explicit to the programmer? Yeah, good question. So, when when you're designing any of these kinds of features or language features or even libraries, you have this really hard trade off that you have to make, which is how much is it magic or how much is it in the human's control? How much can they predict and control it. What do you do when the default case is the wrong case? Mm, yeah. Okay. And so when you're designing a system, um, uh, I won't name names, but there, there are systems yeah. where um, you, it's really easy to get started. 
and then you you jump so let's pick like logo okay so something like this <laughs> so it's really easy to get started it's really designed for uh teaching kids but as you get into it you hit a ceiling yeah. and then you can't go any higher and then what do you do well you have to go switch to a different world and rewrite all your code and this logo is a silly example here this exists in many other languages uh with python you would say uh, uh like concurrency right so python has the global interpreter lock so mm -hmm. threading is challenging in python and so if you if you start writing a large scale application in Python and then suddenly you need concurrency, you're kind of stuck with a series of bad trade offs, right? Um, uh, there's other ways to go where you say, like, foist all the, all the complexity on the user all at once, <laughs> right? And that's also bad in a different way. And so, what, what, I, what I prefer is building a simple model that you can explain that then has an escape hatch. So, you get in, you have guardrails. You uh, memory safety works like this in Swift, where you can start with you, like by default. If you use all the standard things, it's memory safe. You're not going to shoot your foot off. But if you want to get a uh, a C level pointer to something, you can explicitly do that. But by default, it's uh, there's guardrails. It's, there's guardrails. Okay. So, but like you know, if, uh, whose job is it to figure out which part of the code is parallelizable? Um, so in the case of the proposal, it is the human's job. So they decide how to architect their application. And then uh, the runtime in the compiler is very predictable. And so yeah. this this is in contrast to, um, like, there's a long body of work, including on Fortran, for auto-parallelizing compilers. And um, this is an example of a bad thing. And my so as a compiler person, I can rag on compiler people. Um, often compiler people will say, Cool, since I can't change the code, I'm going to write my compiler that then takes this unmodified code and makes it go way faster on this machine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Application develop. And so it does pattern matching. It does like really deep analysis. Compiler people are really smart. And so yeah. they like want to like do something really clever and yeah. tricky. And you get like 10x speed up by taking like an array of structures and turn it into a structure of arrays or something because it's so much better for memory. Like there's bodies, like tons of tricks. Yeah. Um, they love optimization. Yeah, you love optimization. Everyone loves optimization. <laughs> Everyone loves it. Well, and, and it's it's just this promise of build with my compiler and your thing goes fast. Yeah, right. But here here's the problem, Lex. You write you write a program. Mm -hmm. You run it with my compiler. It goes fast. You're very happy. Wow, it's so much faster than the other compiler. Yeah. Then you go and you add a feature to your program or you refactor some code, and suddenly you got a 10x loss in performance. Yeah. Well, why? What just happened there? What just happened there is you the the heuristic the 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 pattern match and the compiler or whatever analysis it was doing just got defeated because you didn't inline a function <laughs> or 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 something right as a user you don't know you don't want to know that was the whole point you don't want to know how the compiler works mm -hmm. you don't want to know how the memory hierarchy works you don't want to know how it got parallelized across all these things you wanted that abstracted away from you but then the magic is lost as soon as you did something and you fall off a performance cliff and now you're in this funny position where what do I do? I don't change my code. I don't fix that bug. Mm -hmm. It costs 10, 10x performance. Now what do I do? Well, this is the problem with unpredictable performance. Right? If, if you care about performance, predictability is a very important thing. And so, um, and so what, the, what the proposal does is it provides a architectural patterns for being able to lay out your code, gives you full control over that, makes it really simple so you can explain it. And then, um, and then if you want to scale out in different ways, you have full control over that. So in your sense, the intuition is for a compiler, it's too hard to do automated parallelization. Like, you know, because the compilers do stuff automatically that's incredibly impressive for other things. Right. But for parallelization, we're not even, we're not close to there. Well, it, d it depends on the programming model. So there's many different kinds of compilers. And so if you talk about like a C compiler or a Swift compiler or something like that, where you're writing imperative code, mm -hmm. Parallelizing that and reasoning about all the pointers and stuff like that is very is a very difficult problem. Now, if you switch domains, so there's this cool thing called machine learning, mm -hmm. right? So machine the machine learning nerds, among other endearing things like you know solving cat detectors and other things like yeah. that, um, have done this amazing breakthrough of producing a programming model, operations that you compose together, mm -hmm. that has raised the level of abstraction high enough that suddenly you can have Auto parallelizing compilers. Right? You can write a model using uh, TensorFlow and have it run on 1,024 nodes of a TPU. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. I didn't even think about like, 
you know, because there's so much flexibility in the design of architectures that right. ultimately boil down to a graph that's parallelizable for you, parallelized for you. And and if you think yeah. about it, that's pretty cool. That's pretty right? cool, yeah. And you think about batching, for example, as a way of being able to exploit more parallelism. Yeah. Like that's a very simple thing that now is very powerful. That didn't come out of the programming language nerds, right? Those people. Like that came out of people that are just looking to solve a problem and use a few GPUs and organically developed by the community of people focusing on machine learning. And it's an incredibly powerful, powerful abstraction layer that enables the compiler people to go and exploit that. And now you can drive supercomputers from Python 